What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Whiskey Web and Whatnot, your favorite podcast about curling with your hosts, Robin Wagner and Charles William Carpenter the third. Yes. And I placed third in the 2014 Olympics for curling. Oh, so. you did? Yes. Okay. So you were out there sweeping? Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. kept it clean. Keep the ice clean. That's what they say. Yeah. Someone else who keeps it clean, our guest today, Kevin Winery. What's going on, Kevin? Not too much, my friends. How are you doing? Thanks so much doing for having well. me. Doing well. Doing well. Yeah. Thank Thanks for being on. Can you please give the folks at home a few sentences about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I'm a part of the Dino team, and Dino is a open source JavaScript and TypeScript runtime uh, that was created by the original author of uh, Node.js. Uh, and it's kind of about like convention over configuration and kind of rolling a lot of the like most adopted technologies in the JavaScript ecosystem directly into the runtime. So there's like built-in TypeScript and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I've been doing uh, DevRel and JavaScript development for uh, kind of a while. I spent uh, about a decade at a, a company called Twilio that has telephony APIs. Uh, and I yeah, did a lot of fun stuff there. I built uh, Twilio Quest, which was a, a web-based technology, like video game, like a mm. desktop oh. PC game. They built with like React and Phaser and stuff like that. So cool. Yeah, I've been kind of bumming around the developer tool space for a while now. <laughs> and I get to do it at Dino, which has been super fun. Nice, nice. Very cool. Yeah, I'm already intrigued with the convention over configuration because that, that hits me in my soul. That's like my the soul. Rails, the Ember. That's, yeah, the, I've been using yes. Ember for 12 years, so. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think you just made Robbie a Dino fan. There we regardless. go. Regardless. Well, I, I haven't tried it, but we will get into some details on it in a minute. So First, what we can start with, though, tell us about the whiskey. Do you need this? Can you read this here? I, I think so. You know, uh, this need... episode is brought to you by I Need Reading Glasses. Mm, I need reading glasses. Dot dot co. Dot UK. Yes, exactly. Dot co. All those things. <laughs> anyway, today we're having the Tempest in Rye. It's a six-year rye that's their regular expression. It is 95% rye and 5% barley, 91.5% proof, little dots, There's degrees. Six. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Alcohol. Yeah. But Let's do it. It keeps happening. All right. That sounds great. Uh, we're going to start with the guest here. Yeah. So pass it down. Pass it down. Pass pass it down. Takes one down. Pass it around. around. Yeah. 95% nice. of rye on the wall. I really you only. know I was going to sing this episode. In the last you? couple of years, kind of come around to whiskey. So I'm stoked mm. to try a new one here. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I initially did everything wrong and Chuck has been educating me about the correct way to do everything. So side note, listener, because there's only one. I've been telling him the wrong stuff the whole time. We all laugh. As together. a joke. It's so <laughs> All the real people put ice in it, but I got him to take ice out. <laughs> I got him to take ice out. <laughs> Crushed ice is yeah. actually a superpower. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> alas, here we go. So we'll start right. with a smell. Yeah, I like to put this in so we don't spill it everywhere. Yeah. You right. act like That's I'm idea. clumsy. Ooh. Okay. It's got some funk. Yeah. That's Bring, nice. give us that funk. We want the funk. It smells like a... It does have a mildewy kind yeah, of smell to it. Yeah, like, like a, a grape candy that you oh, like, stop. you licked it and then you left it out in the elements for a year. I don't, I'm not lying. No, I that got, was on like, the tip of my tongue, but like, <laughs> you, you beat me to it. Yeah, the grape candy the grape smell. Candy you don't smell grape candy? No, I 100% smell that. Okay. And I was like, what is that? And you, as soon as you started yeah, saying it, a I was grape like, lifesaver. I don't know about like Hard sat life out saver. on a... You know, on a well, because of the funky, and, uh, like whatever. mildewy, right? Yeah, it got rained on for a little while, and mm -hmm. you picked it up and smelled it, and you were like, "Would I eat this?" And then you still do. Yeah, sure. No, I probably probably wouldn't. I'm pretty into what? not eating after people or eating you know, weird things. Uh, yeah, the things you put in your body, I'm surprised. Anyway, yeah, we well, can taste this. Yeah, let's give it a shot. I still hmm. got a little bit of that. Now I would almost like take it one step further and be like grape drink. You know, like instead of grape candy, mm. it would go like Kool -Aid? grape drink. No, not Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. Like you had the little jugs or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, the tiny jugs. That Ooh, the little jugs. hugs. With little hugs. Yes. Yeah. Little, little hugs. hugs. Little hugs. This thing? one has a little more hug. Yeah. It has that. Okay. The little the barrel. Yeah. yeah. And then that spice comes out. You get the woodiness. Mm -hmm. You get a little nutmeggy almost. Mm. Yeah. A little bitter, yeah. little nutmeggy. Nutmeg must be a thing. Like nutmeg finishes a lot of whiskey like cocktails I'm discovering. Oh, yes. So, right. Just, yeah. And I taste a little bit of like cinnamony, like you took a little piece of big red and put it with your lifesaver. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I not wrong. None of these answers are wrong. And that is what that, is that so is fun yeah. about this. Unless you say that... smoked salmon. Wrong. Not getting fish. No, yeah. I'm not getting the fish. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if I smelled fish yeah. in my whiskey, you probably wouldn't I'm probably that, just yeah. going to go ahead and nope. say this one's not good. Yeah. I don't, I don't think this is what <laughs> yeah. they meant. 
Mm. Um, oh, is it C-Bass. Norwegian? Yes, okay. Yeah, is this yeah, Norwegian? The rare Norwegian whiskey. Yeah, yeah. 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 Who knows? Yeah, they they're Whoa. more of like a like clean spirits kind of country. Whoa. I think, right? Like, I've not been to Norway. Um, I have been to the Netherlands. I'm trying to think. I was just trying to say, where in that region have I been? Just the Netherlands, I think. Mm. Norway was amazing. I was in. Larvik, like, like there was a, like Dino is a globally distributed company. So we get together like in a random oh, world city, fun. like three times a year. Yes. And we did it in Norway, like just when I joined the company and we took a boat ride with this guy who is like, who was just legendary. Like, I think he just like drives people around in a boat and gives tours for fun. Yeah. And he off the side of his boat, just like dragged like a six pack of beer with him the entire time oh, because like the fjord was so cold. Oh, yeah. Like that oh, was just yeah. how you preferred to to drink. So that was interesting. Uh, I would also prefer that. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's seemed like the way to go. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you a fridge your wine or a in cooler ace. is way too easy. No, no. You <laughs> you go. You okay? You know, right? Fancy Whole Foods boy. You go in there and you're chilling your wine. They put it in water that's chilled and moving. Yeah. Okay. And that quickly. So this things. this brings me that's back true. to it. Yeah. There's a weird thing about water, and this is totally off topic, but it, it triggered my mind. Okay. If your water is hot. It makes ice quicker than cold water. Did you know what? that? Really? And, mm-hmm. and, and more clear. Yeah. Yeah. So because those, like, our big cube. fridge is hooked up to the hot water. I was like, what dumbass did this? And I was like so looking it up and they're like, oh, actually, it's good for water. I was like, okay, I stand corrected. Yes. <laughs> so fun fact to yeah. listener <laughs> is that uh, heat your water before freezing it. Yeah. Even if you do ice trays, it actually, but I know it makes them more clear too. Yes, yeah, so, that theoretically, but you got to have that. water, heat them up. Let's, what's enough talking about that? Let's rate this one. Okay, <laughs> so our rating system, um, as engineers, we like to start at zero, zero indexing. Sure. So it is technically Intel 8. I guess it could be 9. It was based on an octopi-like character a long time yeah. ago. Eight tentacles, Eight but tentacles. it could be zero. Yep, could be zero. Yeah. So zero being horrible, you might as well yeah. just throw the this away. The octopus is gone. Four, middle of the road, not bad, not great for you. Eight being like amazing, clear the shelves. Feel free to compare this in any way that you'd like. We, because we've had so many, will be like, we'll compare this to other rise. You could go whiskeys, you can go just out uh, adult beverages, all you want. I won't put you on yeah. the spot first. Okay. Okay. Appreciate it. That's that's the Absolutely. thing that we do for. Are our you guests. putting me on the spot first for the fourth time in a row, or you is know it what? you this I'll time? take it for you. Okay. You know, <laughs> even, even even though you're not nice. That's fine. Um, that's fine. All righty. So yeah, this is very tasty to me. This is, oh, and price I take into consideration. I think this is around fifty bucks. And yeah, the bottle looks cool. And the bottle looks cool. This nice presentation, interesting flavors, a little hug there. Nothing crazy. I'm probably going to give it a 5.5. Five. It's a 5. It feels like I'm leaning towards 5. It's not like it's above average. It's not incredible. But I definitely would say like, oh, I see this on the shelf. I know this one's pretty decent. We can go with this one. You know, you're you're picking up a, a bottle with friends or or whatever else. So I think for me, this is about a 5.5. Five. Okay. Is it me next or you tell me? Yeah. Kevin, yeah. you, you want to go? I can certainly wait. Okay. So I'm much more of a whiskey plebeian than you two, but... The one that I like the most uh, I, is uh, Sexton, which is an Irish whiskey. Right. And uh, that one, I do drink neat pretty frequently, and I do like it quite a lot. So that's probably like my six. And so oh, I would probably okay. anchor this at around five or five and a half as well. So like I probably do prefer the Sexton a little bit, but this is really nice. Mm. It's really smoothly. Yeah. So my favorite rise, as everyone who listens knows, Sagamore from Baltimore. Good yeah. stuff. This is nothing like that. No, it's very different. So with that in mind, I don't really know what to do because like (laughs) the rye that I would want to taste is not what this tastes like, but this is actually tasty. Yes. So I'm kind of at an impasse. I'm going to rate it in general, I think, without rye in mind. Yes. And give it a 5.92. Because it's good, but it does not really tastes like a rye like if it were a, if this were a bourbon or something else that i'm expecting other flavors from it's it's very good but like it's not spicy enough to be a rye in my opinion what led you to go to the second significant digit there like i just like to be as random as possible okay chuck chuck did like 
I don't know what on the last six point nine two three four seven. There's some, know, right? yeah, right. <laughs> it's like a pie rating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At a certain point, it's all kind of arbitrary anyway. My rating really doesn't speak to your personal rating or anyone else's per se. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like oh, this is better than average. Once you get in the six to seven range, I mean, like. Anything that is pretty good is in that range, so it's kind of arbitrary. Like, if you just love something and you want to do that way more, then great. You should call that an eight and kind of go with it. I would say that this, this is my little addendum to that, is that this is a approachable rye. It's very tasty. True. It's not yeah. high spice like a lot of ryes yep. can be. Like, if you go have lower a wild proof, turkey lower rye, spice. Yeah. it's going to punch you in the mouth a little bit if you haven't had many ryes. Like, this one feels like a nice approachable ride, which is That's why true. I think That's you true. putting it in a different category actually speaks well to folks who might want to start to step yeah. their way there. If you haven't had a ride, maybe rise. start here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. So now to our loot warm takes. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Shit. Yes. Okay. This I'm is ready. shit that people argue about on Twitter. Sorry, yeah. Clark. Anyway. What? Okay. Curse anyway. This is a family show. It's, it's a, a family show. show. They can't hear us out there. Well, streaming. actually, they can. Yes. The people sitting right here can. So, sorry. Yes. Anyway, explicit types or inferred types for TypeScript? In that, I, I'm a bit of a TypeScript curmudgeon in that, like, I like my JavaScript just fine before it had types. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. okay. if we can infer types, that's certainly my, uh, yeah. certainly my preference. Okay. Um, again, because I grew up in the bad old days of writing soft calling functions to create scope when none existed. So uh, yes. as little typing and as little rules as possible is usually what I prefer. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to take you to the other direction. I think I know this answer. Tailwood, no, oh, Tailwind yeah. <laughs> or Vanilla CSS? Like a year ago, I would have told you Vanilla CSS mm -hmm. uh, without question, but I decided like enough like people who I respect and who want to be productive in their own lives are like, Tailwind is great. You'll never go back. Yep. So I was like, okay, like I'm just going to do it for, you know, several months and kind of like hold my nose and not, you know, try to freak out too much. <laughs> and once I kind of like grokked the Zen of it, like utility, like, I, I kind of love Tailwind now. So I actually yeah. am all about Tailwind. Nice. Uh, in, yeah, to be I fair, I saw your tweet where you said that. So, okay. So, you so were, I was like, I know where this is going to go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, get rebase or get merge. Ooh. I mean, I tend to want to merge because I just find that workflow a little, a little easier to, to sure. rock. But so, like, most of the time when I have a choice, I will, I will merge. Okay. Right. Yeah. Rebasing makes no sense, to be fair. Yes. But, you don't get that merge commit of like, you merged this. That's right. That is <laughs> yeah. It does feel a little dirty, yeah. but it kind of like, it makes sense to me because that is like an operation that I performed on the code base. Like That's I true. That's true. And like that is yeah. an event that happened. So, but um, if they would make an in between that I can merge, <laughs> but not have that, I would absolutely choose that. That, that would be yeah. the ideal. So if anybody's, <laughs> you know, with the power to change that. Who, yeah. I don't know who, who can change that. Whoever's writing the new Git and Rust, that's the people that can change. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. That's a good idea. Right, yeah. yeah. That's definitely happening somewhere. I'm sure someone's working yes. on it. I don't know if it'll be popular, but it. we'll see. I'm going to give you the previous one. So okay. sidebar on the left or right in VS Code? D definitely on the left, I could see. If, the, only, the only way I could see, like, you preferring the right is if you came up in that .NET world. Because I think in Visual Studio, like, C-sharp projects by default have the yeah. sidebar. So, but yeah. I've always, you know, been Sublime Text, TextMate, yeah. VS Code yeah. from that tradition. And the sidebar is usually. Yeah. So. It's, I feel like it's rare to find someone that cares enough to move it. Like, <laughs> if you that's the found upside. that config, you're probably just deleting the sidebar and like yeah. searching for stuff i didn't even try like, like i don't think you can drag and drop it over there no like it's in the no, setting it's a yeah, yeah, yeah it's you a do setting have to. thing and the yeah. settings don't let you find stuff unless you open the json file and like manually do it yeah, yeah. so yeah, that can be yeah. Right. it takes a lot of work to yeah. change things and i don't care enough right that's yeah. really what it is because i'm default? searching for every file i have too many files to look at the sidebar and find it yeah so yeah. <laughs> i was just saying i had the same path true. in text editor as as you did, like I really didn't go through like heavy IDEs, so it was like sublime text for quite some time, really. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I started off like in Eclipse most of the time. Oh, right? yeah. Once Eclipse. I was able to kind of make the jump from So you didn't do Dreamweaver? I, I skipped Dreamweaver. I like Dreamweaver is kind of already kind of passe. Yeah. I was yeah. coming up. So. so I came from like I basically photography and mm-hmm. then getting into web tools through that. So it was like Adobe has a bolt on thing here. You go from Photoshop to that and then look at your tables and how terrible this is. But, you know, at least they map together. And then as soon as I was out of that world, yeah. 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 Never I, figured out Vim really. Like I learned mm-hmm. colon Q, and that's basically yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's Everyone still, learned how to quit it after yeah. they accidentally opened it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah <I> <laughs> One point did know like some shortcuts for inserts and moving up and down in that, and that was pretty much it. And I was like, I'm only doing this in this time because I have to for yeah. this reason. Yeah. And I kind of never came back to it. I remember another time like. A colleague broke his hand or something, mm. so he basically had to learn how to work he one hand. Couldn't mouse. Wow. Yeah, he couldn't mouse, and so he like got really good at Vim. And I'd watch him, and I'd always be like, "I'd love to do that," and then never. It's did impressive it. to well, watch. Yeah, yeah, people who are good at Vim look like they are like hacking the mainframe. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, that's impressive. that's yeah. what hackers yeah. actually yeah. look like. And oh the yeah, movies, they're yeah. like, "Oh, this does happen." Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I always use Nano. I was like that one guy. Yeah, I use Nano. Like yeah. <laughs> I have to like edit my like Z, like my RC files. Like yeah. I'm usually Nano. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see. Are you wanting me to ask this one? Is that what you were saying? I'm just saying I'm not. You, that's oh, your okay. choice. Was GraphQL a mistake? I don't think GraphQL was a mistake. I think it actually is reasonable in some contexts. Like I, I've seen it, especially like if there's like a, I, I was looking at a product recently that lets you sort of like manage high volumes of logging data and putting like GraphQL interfaces on top of like large unstructured data sets makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Yeah. It just seems to be a lot of work to like get the tooling set up and it's you, know, once you get it set up, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. But also, like, I, I haven't necessarily, like, tried it and then been so blown away that I'm like, oh, this is very obviously better than a REST API, and I need right. to, like, change everything that I know about sure. HTTP APIs. So, yeah, I think they, like, I've definitely seen use cases where they've been, like, a pretty obviously good choice. Yeah, yeah I think that's fair. A mistake I, it, would be too strong, I'd yeah. say. At this point, I've forgotten why people said it was a mistake, but it was a thing for a minute. Well, Do you remember the reason? starting reasons? to latch on to, well, first of all, some people discovered JSON API and realized like, which has been oh, around forever. All of my yeah. reasons for picking this were actually already solved in JSON API and, and you know, the includes and like kind of customizing your payloads a little bit per page. Mm-hmm. So it was really more of a client side issue of things. I think GraphQL is a good tool in like large microservice architectures, for example, where you can have a federated graph and then like each service owns its own thing. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of uh, another argument against GraphQL was around like, oh yeah, well now front end engineers can basically like throttle your response times by including or discluding certain fields. But that's and when good. They, well, no, it's not necessarily if you don't know you don't know the story of that resolver. Just because you add one field and maybe that resolver hits a, another service that is a crawler and mm. it's like crazy. So you stuff. made it exponential without knowing. You may yeah, you made it super slow without knowing, but then like contract testing sort of solves that for you, right? Yeah. Like as soon as the contract changes on either side, there's a little warning thrown up and at least then you've done something to mitigate that. But like, yeah, that was another argument against it, which you know, potentially the same thing happens in JSON API when you decide to do an additional include yeah. for a mm-hmm. separate table that is not performant. Yep. Yeah. So I uh, think the configurability yeah. is good in general. Yeah. Like mm. sometimes APIs are really heavy and you just want like one field. Yeah. Like that part, like scoping it down, down is, is better. Nice. Yeah. Adding can get messy. Yeah. Right. Right. Like regular CRUD APIs are just like wild, wild west, right? Yeah. Like, so that is true. But I, I feel like you probably need to have a reason to want a GraphQL API. Like the, I think there's so. some kind of use case for your clients where like it is actually important that they can control the size of the feed. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise yeah. the REST API is probably a It's not a mistake. It's just not a panacea like everybody thought five years yeah. ago. Yeah. I don't think it's like a default choice. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. By any means. Yeah. All right. Well, the final one is what do you think about nested ternaries? 
Yes, to Turner. So you have gone a little deep, like on my Twitter rants. I feel like because uh, the Nested Turner is a is a this major. This isn't just a whiskey mind. podcast, just so you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so you have a serious research team behind this, like going into. Yes, yeah, yeah, so we spend literal I'm minutes. Looking, I think it's been dozens of minutes yeah. before every episode. Um, I compensate no. myself well for it. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So not a fan, but specifically in the context of like JSX, like if you have a large like tree of JSX that is all like being conditionally rendered by ternaries, which is kind of the pattern within uh, JSX, yep. like that code is very difficult to read and to understand mm -hmm. like under what conditions this little block of something is being rendered. So if you must have like nested ternaries, like don't have like also then huge chunks of HTML in your JSX. In yeah. Your so. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, JSX, I feel like, could benefit from just having, like, a switch statement or a bunch of if statements. Like, they don't make that easy, but you should just be able to, like, it's definitely this, it's definitely this, instead of, like... Yeah, you could imagine yeah. there being, like, a higher-order component that like, yeah. handles Boolean logic or conditional... Yeah, like every other framework has, maybe. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he did make this a JSX yeah. problem and not yeah. a React problem. Well, that's so true. So bear in mind, yeah. I did actually no, kind of appreciate that you said, like, this is a thing it you is can a JSX do in any problem. JSX. This isn't a That's React true. thing. It's a because in React a... class based, you can you don't have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you like uh, class based components? Um, yeah. Evangelist? Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, I, I've been using Ember and will use Ember until it dies. And okay. like, so I don't care about all this. Like, oh, we're doing server components and the whatever, and then not relevant to me. But I see. But I, I see. do like to play devil's advocate on the opposite side of everything. So, you did okay. like Next for a minute. No, no. Okay. All right. I like, <laughs> I like the next and remix and all these things add like sane defaults on top of react mm -hmm. because that was my big thing about react is like, okay, you install it and now you need to figure out the next 15 packages you want to install to do all the things you need for a framework. You've never written a thunk or a saga. So I don't feel no, I, I have been, oh, man. no. Okay. This is a rabbit hole <laughs> and I won't go all the way down it, but we used Ember Redux and did a bunch of thunks and sagas and bullshit. And okay, I was right. like, we're using Ember, but the guy like above me was like, no, we're gonna use uh, Redux. And I was like, right. no. Every data was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. It's well, good. that's it's a rant for another day. Okay. So let's talk about something more modern and up to date here. Dino, what's going on with Dino these days? Sure, yeah. So yeah, we actually just dropped the 1.40 release, but yeah, basically the goal of Dino is to like kind of rectify some of the like configuration hell that's kind of happening within the Node.js ecosystem and mm -hmm. sort of combine a lot of the tools that you're going to need anyway, mm -hmm. like your lyncher, your formatter, your testing, testing framework, you know, TypeScript and JSX kind of being sort of standard language extensions, things like that. So we're also working on the Dino 2.0 launch, which is going to be happening here in a couple months. Um, nice. And yeah, we have some exciting stuff planned for that. It's not a state secret, but we are working on a uh, TypeScript first, ECMAScript module first uh, registry, which we hope Ooh. will be, you know, a little bit more efficient. We'll automatically generate documentation, kind of like the Rust crates like ecosystem. You know, when you publish your crate, you have very nicely generated API reference oh. actually within the registry website hmm. itself. And yeah, it's kind of solving some of the problems that we've had with like HTTP URL imports, which is one of the sort of novel features of Dino, which is like, you can include a TypeScript file, like just from an arbitrary URL. Yeah. And we kind That's of started cool. down that path because that is like the webby way to do it. Like Dino is intended to be as browser-like as possible. Right. But like that leads to problems like, you know, duplicate dependencies or like your server goes down and, it, and like it happens at an inconvenient time during a build. So there are some, you know, advantages of a centralized package manager that we think would benefit. You know, so we're working on that. But yeah, that's, it's going to be pretty exciting. Again, kind of launching towards the, you know, March, April sort of time frame. Um, right. And yeah, okay. we'll work to get that done. But nice. Yeah. That sounds yeah, like that a sounds pretty great. big thing. Yeah. 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 I've had a lot of problems with like, you know, nothing, it's the wild west and no one's like shipping types the right way. Or if they do, it's like, yeah. oh, well, you got to put this specific, like, what's your module type and what's your stuff, all these like different, oh, well, okay, this is kind of a separate RAN, I guess, but like all the different types of JavaScript modules is a big problem of like the common JS and the AMD and the yeah. everything. 
Yeah. And it's like, oh, we'll just put in what your type is and it'll like figure it out. And then like, we need to not do that and just ship like ECMAScript modules and like have them be typed script by default. And then like, you're good. Yep. Yes. It's, it's, that's what we're building. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, yeah. You know, TypeScript source code is what you ship to the registry. Right. But we've managed to figure out a way to do it such that like you can actually import these modules in Node, like through NPM as well. Nice. And yeah, and I like being able to just deal with TypeScript and just publish TypeScript, we think will be a, a much more ergonomic way if like you're writing your library in TypeScript anyway, to not have to deal with all the shenanigans of yeah. like kind yeah. of providing your types and, uh, and sort of manually setting yeah. all that stuff up. Yeah, first class citizen rather than bolt-on yeah. kind of ideology. Yep, totally. Yep. In terms of like a drop-in replacement for Node, for example, like where are we at in that? Yeah, so... It's, it's kind of a, yeah, it's, it's a little rough because the ph philosophical stance that sort of Dino has taken is that the web platform is probably the thing that will persist forever. Like it will be here long after all of us are done right. uh, writing code and the server side JavaScript environment should mirror the, you know, the web platform as much as possible, which is kind mm -hmm. of why, Dino is part of like winter CG, which is, you know, a working group trying to like standardize web APIs like outside right. the browser. Uh, Cloudflare is also a member and you know, folks from Vercel and Netlify participate as well. And that sort of stands in opposition to some of the stuff that's happening in Node where like when Node was initially created, there weren't a lot of web standards that could be applied to the problems that Node was trying to solve. But that's, that's different now. So we want to, again, make Dino the most web-like programming environment possible. Right. But that sometimes is at odds with like trying to support like how Tailwind deals with the node modules folder after installation. Like, there's a lot of like very specific things that library authors have done over the years that are very tightly coupled to like node modules and how NPM clients uh, right. set up that directory. Yeah. So the... But the actual answer is like, actually a lot of the NPM ecosystem does just work in Dino. Like if you in include it, there's like a NPM specifier is what it's called in Dino. So you can just import uh, node packages and many of them work. Yeah. Where a lot of the friction still exists is with like tool chains that have been built around like NPM and NPM workflows and like the node modules directory and stuff like that. So like yeah. Vite actually works like pretty darn well in Dino these days, but like there's a lot of tooling like in Next.js, which we haven't gotten working yet. So that's like kind of the big focus for the team that's working on node compatibility is like getting better at handling the tooling that exists in the node ecosystem. I mean, but do you think that triangle companies are really going to last? I mean, I don't know if they make it. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. Right? They're, they're pretty good at uh, pretty yeah. good at making it easy to ship websites. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Web You love to hate framework. them, I think. Yes. <laughs> Listen, just because Guillermo screwed us over for free whiskey that he could clearly can afford. Um, I don't know. I think he's hurting for money. Like every developer tool company that I've ever seen, like I just, I, I just expect to see his name now. Like, yeah, and I know. Guillermo yeah, Rush, they're they're yeah. they're involved. They're yeah. investing. They're like, and I appreciate yeah. that, and I appreciate. It. I, I, there's a lot of things that I do appreciate that they're working on, and folks they work with, and everything else. But fuck that guy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Am I oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, gosh. No. But yeah. We support I mean, like, Vercel. We use it. It's we good. Do. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we give them money. Yeah, we, we use do. it. I've I've been a Next.js user all the way up till 14. I find 14 slightly challenging, but I think that there's definitely an application for it. I've always appreciated that they gave sane guardrails to React, right? Like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't choose your own adventure anymore. And I think we'll go down that path a little bit, talking about totally, books totally. and stuff that, that we we're into. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, it, it's been like a wide path that they have over time narrowed. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're now kind of putting you in, 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 not you specifically, but folks in their lane to take advantage of their, the framework is good and it does a lot of things, but the framework is really just do this very easily so that you can have our suite of tools. Yeah. We're a web application hosting company. Yeah. But they're realizing that that's framework that's agnostic. Like they're very integrated with Astro now. Yep. They've, Definitely. they've got Svelte obviously with Rich yeah. Harris, like they're doing mm -hmm. stuff with that. Like they're not just well, use yeah. Next.js or like, no, no, the first, get out of the here. first like, is free, of course. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then like you kind of get introduced and you bring all your friends. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I don't know. I always thought that I'm way. A, I'm a fan. It's it's very nice DX, you know, for especially when you're just kind of getting started. But I feel like every framework that lives long enough, you know, becomes the villain eventually. That's like true. it just it finds a point right. of complexity where, you know, I'm, you start to question how much value you're getting. I'm not not a fan. I just start to like when you start to infiltrate every part of my life, my professional life in this point, like <laughs> I just start to get a little like, mm, I'm uncomfortable about it. Yeah, that's know. true. So, yeah, yeah. I, and they're running a business, so it has nothing to do with my opinion. Yeah. There are they good seem alternatives, to... though. Like, like, so, like Spell Kit's great, Astro's great. Absolutely. Like, well, I, I don't think, like, Next is going to be sort of the only game in town. Oh, well, no, definitely not. You know, Spell Kit is, is in the mothership, so yeah. for now, Astro is not, and love Astro. No, Astro kind of well, is. They get sponsored, but they're not like, you know, Fred doesn't work That's at true. Herself. Like which, oh which oh wait, Fred works at Vercel now. No, I hope so. <laughs> shit. This just in. Damn yeah. it, Fred. Can we still be friends? If I should talk to your friend, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, I was going somewhere with that. I think it's to the <laughs> next cute logo, which is like obviously Dino, super cute. Absolutely. What about the other super cute runtime, everything, whatever's going on there? Bun. The the little the little bow bun. He's pretty cute. He's, he's not, adorable. Yeah, not yeah. Lie. Man, how so, do you feel about it? I think it's like, it's good and sort of validates that like we're at a moment where Node is no longer like just going to be assumed to be the default runtime for it. Sure, sure. Right? Sure. Like we are in a world where Worker D exists, where Bun exists, where Dino exists. And I think like that's a reality that like JavaScript developers are going to kind of have to work through and figure out like, you know, what what things actually work, what things are you know, real and what are not. Um, so I think it's good. Like the additional competition is good. It's going to make... It certainly makes everybody innovate a little bit mm -hmm. with a little bit more urgency. Than yeah, would, right. Uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think it's pretty cool. The I think like the choice of Zig is like interesting because interesting of, is the word for it. Yeah. <laughs> just I mean, like obviously, there's lots yeah. of very cool technical aspects of it as oh, a yeah. language. Mm -hmm. um, but choosing Zig means that like it's a giant pain in the ass to get Bun working on Windows, right? Like sure, yeah. you know, right. because like Dino is written in Rust, like that's not a problem. Right? Yeah, it's Rust works great on Windows. Um, yeah. So I think there's but it's like one millisecond you know, slower, maybe. It's, <laughs> that's that's possible. That's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like I that is actually something that's been nice, like. Writing Dino in Rust has, like, yes, it is fast, but the idea of, but, like, the fact that Dino is now, like, easily embeddable in any Rust thing actually ends up being a pretty useful trick. Yeah. Because it's showing up, like, in, like, Towery, which is, like, a desktop web application frame or a desktop application framework for Rust. And in a couple, like, unexpected use cases here and there. So, no, I mean, I, I, I think, like, what Bun also kind of demonstrated is that there is a lot, there's a lot of hunger to be able to like bring a lot of the node ecosystem, like to whatever this new or whatever yeah. other runtimes are going to exist. Like, I don't know if worker D had like a node compatibility layer, you know, before then, or if, I don't know if it was influenced by that at all, but I think like, that's going to be something that like, that's why Dino has like three, four engineers in a given week, like working on node compatibility is because yeah. that's going to be important in the, in the future. So, yeah. um, I do think like that's that's been good and has been like a act of service that has been beneficial to everyone that's building this next generation of runtimes is to say like, the ecosystem is important and we need to like support that adequately because yeah. I think like that's part a big part of like what people are responding to with Bun too. Yeah, yeah, I think that and just like that they aren't using anything logical to do all the things and they're just like we use this and like it's faster and it's like okay, well yeah. now everyone can be like well you could technically do it in that speed. So how do we make ours a little faster? And like, it is pushing everyone towards like, how do we be better? Even though like stability is probably way lower on bun than the other offerings. It's like, that does force people to take a look and be like, we could probably do that a little differently. So yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's part of the, you know, competitive pressure. Yeah. Like if, yeah. You know, this benchmark says this thing, like that is sort of a gauntlet thrown down of like, well, maybe we need to relook at how we, you know, how our HTTP server works under the covers, which yeah. is certainly something we've done. Also, like benchmarks, you know, people know benchmarks are benchmarks, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's maybe not always like the be all end all of like you can probably yeah. design. You benchmark. skew them to be what you want. Yeah. yeah. So like yeah. Uh, definitely they're seen important, that. but like certainly, you know, would take with a grain of salt under yeah. the covers. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. 
Certainly not calling Jared out specifically on that because, you know. Yeah, super yeah, smart it, guy. It, it's in a lane. He's done product, that. Yeah. Other people have done benchmarks. And again, you can He's throw... not the first to done it. Like, oh, no, do no, it. no. Yeah. Far from yeah. 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 yeah, indeed. And again, like, you know, it, it's only based on a subset of things that you decide are, are a benchmark. And you could throw in one different thing and change that and whatever else. There's no doubt that, like, Dano's faster... Bun is faster than Node, right? Like, this is true. Mm -hmm. That is 100% the case. I wonder, like, is it is it an all or nothing when you kind of choose this path too? Like, could you Bun as your package manager? Could you Deno as your runtime? Could you could you start to game that? You a might be bit? able to Deno. I don't know if you can Deno. Listen, <laughs> I was validated. I wasn't going to call you out on yeah. it. But <laughs> what did Ryan call it right, when so, he announced it? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. when, and yeah, when Ryan that Bell, way. Like, introduced uh, Dino to the world, he did call it Deno for like the and, first however long. And my brain is old and it got way in there and it just is a hard thing for me to switch. <laughs> That's not my fault. Completely understandable. That is yeah. a thing that exists on, yeah. in the world. And like with using multiple runtimes, I do think that's entirely possible. Like, I think like Node... The node runtime itself is very unlikely to ever run on like edge servers, say. Right, right. So like there's going to be some use cases for which node is just not an option. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I think there's certainly a world in which maybe you use multiple runtimes for different use cases in different scenarios. So it, it, I mean, it's almost like the browser wars to a degree, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, now we're going through runtime options and there's a lot of pluses and minuses for each one. And, you know sort of how do you play that along for your application for what your needs are who knows like could be this here this here this there yeah that's true yep it's entirely possible and i and i imagine there will be convergence much like in the browser you know could, market right now yeah it's like as like these apis become more standardized like maybe we'll converge around like web standards that are pretty universally adopted for server-side javascript as well. yeah which would be great mm -hmm. i think like, but it helps yeah. everyone yep agreed so I do want to go a little bit to a different topic now. So your talk here was about key value databases. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about a little bit about what those are and what you would use them for? Yeah, sure. So the uh, talk itself did kind of survey the landscape of key value databases, like uh, different choices and when you might use one. The uh, sort of uh, canonical use cases for key value databases, which are exactly as they sound like, you take a little bucket of data and you stick it in a database associated with like one, with a one-to-one -one mapping with a key and retrieve it in much the same way, kind of like local storage in the browser. Uh, and I, those types of use cases tend to be good for like data that is usually associated one-to-one -one with some kind of easily identifiable key. So like user preferences or a shopping cart or like API response caches is another one. Like yeah. you don't want to make a super expensive, like open API request over and over again, like caching those results can sometimes be uh, useful depending on how expensive those operations are. So very useful for those uh, types of things. Some key value databases you can use as like your primary application data store too. So like DynamoDB or FoundationDB, which is a right. uh, uh, database underneath uh, DinoKV, which is kind of baked into the Dino runtime. And then uh, Redis being another option that's pretty robust in terms of like the query set. But generally, like when you don't want to use them is when consistency is very important. So like if you have, um, you know, financial transactions, HR records, or data that is just naturally relational. You have users that have many photos and sometimes relational databases are just the proper way to model right. data. But like... You can get by with key value databases in a lot of ways by like using the key space creatively. So like you can create keys that kind of look like paths in a REST API. So like mm -hmm. it could be slash blog slash 2008 slash whatever. And by cleverly designing your keys, you can actually sort of query your key value database by knowing how your keys are structured and pulling oh, out multiple right. records that way as well. So it's an interesting um, one. Yeah, so uh, that's that's kind of a, the the short version, um, but yeah, they all kind of have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, I think like a DynamoDB is really interesting because you can use it kind of like a document database or a key value store. Yeah, it obviously, I've never is, seen that as a key value store. I've always seen it as a document database. So that use case is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it has. It can very much operate in that mode. 
and you kind of choose like when you're storing data which of those two modes you want to you want right. to use like the interface to it itself does feel like you're doing your taxes but like it is very <laughs> it is very powerful um, yeah. as, a, as a tool how much time you have yeah. to like put into i read the books by i think it was like alex dubois like is the big dynamo db guy yeah. and he's all about like plan your access patterns and then move forward yeah, that I think when you get really deep is what is how like you need to approach data model. You do have to do a lot of pl more planning up front because like yeah. you don't have ad hoc querying like you do in a SQL database or right. like a traditional document database. So yeah. it does require being a little more clever and intentional about where that data is going or I'm mean, more migrating in that direction eventually. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, otherwise I've always used them for either caching solutions mm -hmm. or state, right? Like you want API a state, great. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like if you have relational data or any kind of schemas you want to enforce, I feel like you do that separately with your whatever you want to use. And then if you want to cache the response from that like API request for that data, then you're using like this is like the in between mm -hmm. for that is what we're saying, right? Or yeah, kind of. It's like the one of the benefits of like a key value database is the actual data that you store it like maps very closely to whatever your application's data model is because you can just throw kind of arbitrary object structures in there. So you do usually have to, in your own software, have a layer that does the schema validation and stuff like that. But luckily, like we have things like Zod and Joy and like other, you know, scheme, like JavaScript object schema libraries which are pretty sweet and have like really good TypeScript support. So it's easy to emit types that you can use to like kind of use like, you know, types as data transfer objects essentially, and then right. use those as the interface to the functions that actually talk to your database and stuff like that. Okay. Well, there you gotcha. go. There are some smart, smart yeah. patterns right there. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. You just solved the problems for out. me. Yeah. Okay. Like computer science professors would be proud. <laughs> they wouldn't be proud of me, but. <laughs> no, no one's, they no would no not and are not proud of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, all right. I wanted to talk a little bit about how you've created some courses on Pluralsight and like front end masters and things of that nature. And just like, what was that experience like? Do you plan to do any more of that? Yeah, it's actually, it's been a hot minute since I've like done any larger scale courses, but Mark Grabansky, who runs uh, front end masters, runs uh, Minneapolis. I'm from uh, Minneapolis oh, as well. Okay. So well, there you go. great guy. It's been, it was fun doing the course. Like I, I did a node course many years ago now, but like, I, I like taught how to use like Elastic Beanstalk and like, how do you like deploy node in a, you know, production state. I do love teaching. Like I kind of, I've been in doing DevRel for about 15 years and a lot of time within that has been spent on like developer training, education. I built like a certification program at one point. Oh, and, very cool. Yeah. So I, I love like classroom teaching, especially like I do, I do enjoy content creation, but like, I think I like having a class of like 20 people in a room and like being able to equip that set of people uh, yeah. even more when that is an option. So, yeah. yeah, it is easier to like, if people are having problems, you walk around and actually help them versus like, if it's online, maybe they message you or you can't really see what they're doing, but yeah. Yeah. It's certainly more scalable. Uh, but, yeah. But it is fun to like see the light bulb go on and, yeah. so, and somebody finally gets what you're trying to get to stand. So, yeah. But yeah, they, it's cer certainly fun to do like the plural side stuff. I think like we syndicated some content with them. I think I, I worked on some Toyo stuff with them as well um, way back in the day, but yeah, uh, content creation. I think, I, I don't know if Clark talked about it this morning, but content creation is just, everybody does it now apparently. Like it's just sort of the way in which oh, you man. communicate with developers. So. Right. And yeah. It, I'm, I'm too old for all that. Yeah. It, <laughs> it feels like everyone, yeah. but I think it's just that like, obviously web development software engineering, these things have like grown as a need mm -hmm. throughout the world for many companies and sort of like, there's more of us now. So yeah. yeah, a lot of people are creating content, but what is that? Like maybe 1%, 2% of like the overall industry, like it's yeah. actually probably lower. But there's still a lot of competition, even at that percent. Yeah. 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 You're still kind of fighting over yeah. a little bit of space, but I don't know. Yeah. What I want to know about is like, so if you take a heavy object. Right. Like a, like a Pojo, that kind of object? Not exactly. No, no. no. Like <laughs> not, something not, with not real weight. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like actually if I, I can feel like it. Like something that's maybe 
Put it in my arms. Like, made of stone. I actually, don't or know. Something? I don't know how heavy they are. are like they, ten pounds, they stone? twenty pounds. Uh, so, so yeah, we're, we're getting to the, <laughs> the point of talking about the curling stick, yes, which I believe go. is forty pounds. Forty pounds. Whoa, so okay, it's heavy. way heavier it than I thought. Kind of like okay, stone or something. Yeah, as like a plastic yeah. sliding mechanism. It looks there. like so. So it is like pure stone. They're okay. like uh, extremely expensive too. Like if you like break a wreck one, like it's actually kind of a big deal. Yeah. Um, but, but it's a smooth stone that's like concave underneath. Like it kind of looks like a con oh, contact lens. So there's only like a kind of a ring of the stone that makes contact yes. with the ice when you slide it. Um, oh, down interesting. The, uh, so so folks at home, yeah. we are talking about the Olympic sport called curling the weirdest sport on ice and so, uh, we're not talking fun, to though. And, oh, it's fun. and just so you know wait kevin is not canadian right just no, not. minnesota kind of is, you mean, could be close yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. okay so yeah. curling he probably knows west boss so <laughs> yeah they're probably neighbors <laughs> they're just like you know one passport away <laughs> yeah so let's talk about curling about a bit you see it on tv you're like i want to try that you have yeah. Curling lanes. What do they call that? What is yeah. the field well, of play? A, a curling sheet is what sheet. you call sheet. it. So, like at mm -hmm. a curling facility, they'll usually have. There's a facility. Like, okay. like uh, yeah, like two to six like sheets or maybe eight sheets at a very big mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Minnesota, the, in the bustling metropolis of Chaska, is the Chaska Curling Center, which is where a lot of like U.S. Olympians train. And like other teams, like the Filipino national team trains in Chaska, Minnesota. Oh, wow. Uh, well. okay. Interesting. Um, yes, because like on the islands of the Philippines, not super they don't have a lot of ice. Yeah, yeah, it's like the Jamaican bobsled team <laughs> yeah. a little bit. I, I mean, it's more like the competition to because I'm there's, sure like, it's hard, but... there's like 20 people in the Philippines who are really good at curling, but probably a few more in the U.S. and in Minnesota. That's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. But yeah, but basically like I did watch curling like on TV and I was like, that like 55 year old dude with like uh, a dad bod is like out there competing for a gold medal. I'm like, I could do that. Like, <laughs> I was obviously I get in wrong. this playing like, field. Like, it was, it's not as easy <laughs> as it looks. Of or, course, like, as these things, yeah. as, as these things tend to be. Yeah. But I just like it. Like, I just think it's it's fun there. Once you, I'm I'm not good or consistent enough to like participate in the strategic part of the sport yet. Okay. But once you do get to the point where you can like drop your stone right where you want it. It is like, it is chess on ice is what they, okay. what the practitioners like to call mm, it. And right. Like positioning your stones in such a way where like you're cutting off different shots or like forcing a team to, to like take a different path towards the target. It's, uh, it's really fun. I've really enjoyed learning it. So. So is it advantageous to be first or set? Like, do you knock people out of the way? Like, do you want to be first or not? Like, you know, it is considered advantageous to be, to go second because okay. you have the most information about like how to throw, okay. that's called having the hammer. When you have the hammer, you are going second. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Uh, so sometimes you will actually intentionally lose an end, which is like an inning in uh, curling towards the end of a match, because you want to have the hammer going into the, ah. into the final mm. uh, round so that you can play defensively and set up uh, guards in front of the target and stuff like okay. that. Okay. So, Interesting. Uh, it, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's, is it like, I don't even know. I don't even have like great context here. So you're like, okay, so there's more than one. It's like playing. Uh, it's like shuffleboard. Yes. Right. But not really. If you played boxing yeah. yes. before. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, because like, yeah, there's eight stones that each team gets to throw and there's in like, there's different forms of it, but the most common one, there's four players on the team. Yes. And each player throws two stones. Okay. And you take turns like you like each team goes one after the other, and yeah, if you are, and then the last person to throw is called the skip, and they're like the, sort of the manager. They're usually the best player on the team, and while the other players are throwing, they're down by the target, like calling out where uh, the stone right. should go, yes, yes, yes. and like telling the players that are sweeping because you have the little brooms that you yes, take out as well. That, yeah. This is what I think. Uh, of, yeah. and, they, and they will and they will yell sweep for like how hard or like when to start sweeping. Yeah. Because sweeping, what it does is it melts the ice in front of the stone, yeah. uh, and it makes the stone go like. If the, if you just throw the stone, it curves quite a bit when it yeah. goes down the ice. Okay. But if you sweep this the ice in front of it, it flattens out the curve and makes it go further. Huh. See, so the sweeping helps like kind of control the arc of the stone when it's wow. going down. The ice. See, yeah. yeah, there's so much to it that you wouldn't yeah. realize. Yeah, I'm of interested course. in the history of like. Did they start just throwing stones and they were like, wait, we could sweep and like make these go better. 
I don't know. Like, not exactly sure. Who invented food? Yeah, I think that's it's like what a I Viking. Went. It's like a it is like a Seems sort very of Viking Scandinavian like. peninsula. Okay. City, I so they should crush this, but apparently not. I think like mm. Canada is usually the kind best. of near the top of the heap. Yeah. The US does compete pretty frequently. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. The US team's been the same for like the past every Olympics, I feel like. Yeah, like, it's I mean, teams especially, like, they get good at working together. Like, yeah. the skip of a team that's been together for a long time knows exactly how hard everybody throws. And, right. like, kind of, yeah. So, like, a unit staying together for a long time is a, is a It's pretty sport. advantageous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, so breaking in might be tough. Do they I all live like in Minnesota? There, many are. Like, we definitely have Olympians that are Minnesotans. They certainly come to train a lot. But, yeah, it's... I think, like, it, my Olympic hopes might be a little bit misplaced, but uh, <laughs> I definitely have, like, You've got I, don't time. Know, I like I'll learning about anything. Like, yeah. I'm kind of, like, going deep enough to understand, like, oh, I understand the nuances of, like, what we are trying to accomplish here. And uh, I, I love I that it's yeah. approachable, though, yeah. in, in like, the sense yes. of, like, okay, I'm 46, like, my soccer dreams are over, yeah. but what else The long is? jump, probably not. Oh, like, yeah, also yeah. That, yeah. yeah. None yeah. of those things were, like too much body athletic as yeah. athleticism this is more like dedication like, and figuring out the like yeah a little bit working yeah on skill like, yeah this skill game touch and, you, and yeah. you can curl forever like there's you know folks that are in their 80s out there on the ice sometimes so like it's, yeah, it's definitely so a sport nice. for life mm. so, yeah there's hope for us there is yeah. <laughs> i mean do i have to every major to town has a curling club like i bet if wherever there's yeah. a they want a phoenix curling club they're probably i'm, it, sure, they know. Know. I'm sure there is yeah. Yeah. Like, hockey rinks like i went to uh, a friend yes, of ours as like a kid in a hockey league then in this giant complex with he with rinks oh like, yeah i'm surprised yeah. how serious the hockey is in phoenix to be honest like you can go it to these wild. stores that are like mini walmarts of hockey equipment mm. well, it's because everyone's so hot so they're like give me something cold to be <laughs> maybe well i think bobby hill on king of the hill once said that phoenix was a testament to man's hubris uh which is just <laughs> i think like hockey in phoenix is kind of the emblem of that yeah like, there's yeah. no water it's all in hot the, you're yeah. in the middle of the desert yeah, and you're like, we're gonna do like this thing multiplex yeah um, in the i don't the remember desert. which hockey team they bought to make the coyotes but it was something like montreal or some like serious and brought it to Phoenix. And brought it to Phoenix. It was <laughs> sort of like, we, I love we it. You. It might have been like Winnipeg, because I think Montreal mm. ended up being Canada, Colorado. And then they just brought Montreal mm. back eventually. They were like, we can't not have a team. We're Canada. Like, yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. We um, are getting close well, to the end. So, yeah. So, question that we ask everyone most of the time if you weren't in tech, what career would you choose? So I actually graduated with a political science degree. Like I okay. uh, right. was in computer science and I had an internship at kind of an enterprise software company, sat in a cubicle for a summer and was like, no way, I'm never, <laughs> never coming back. <laughs> so I studied poli-sci and I uh, specifically like international relations and diplomacy. So I think there's an alternate universe where, you know, I'm in the State Department foreign service somewhere and trying yeah. to you know, cut deals and make bad situations a little less bad. Yeah. So I, so I think that, that could be, that could be pretty cool. Yeah. Other than that, though, I, I, there, like, there's an organization in Minnesota called the International Institute that works with like uh, refugees and uh, like recent immigrants. Uh, and, that, and working with those communities is always pretty cool because uh, they tend to be, they tend to be fighters. They, they came for a reason because they both, yeah, uh, so it's, Something in that space would be really fun to work on full time too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that sounds both like awesome things. You yeah. do a lot more cool cool shit than I do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So before we end, is there anything you want to plug or anything we missed talking about? No, I think just like kind of mark your calendars towards the end of March, early April. Uh, we have some fun stuff coming out with Dino 2.0 and our mm. uh, TypeScript and ECMAScript uh, registry, which uh, you know are, we're uh, collabing up with. Uh, our friends at Cloudflare on a little bit. So yeah. lots of fun stuff yeah. to keep here, you know, <laughs> keep on the radar uh, later on in uh, the quarter. Yet. Also, next cool. Deno. Dino. Dino. Yes. We're going to get you there. Wait. You probably not. It's okay. In Tokyo, I want to go. Oh, oh, yeah. I saw there was. Yeah, there what? was a Dino Fest in Tokyo, which the uh, Tokyo Dino community is incredible. And Yusuke, who's the maintainer of Hono, which is like an express like framework oh, yeah. for okay. Yeah, so I heard about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, I love Hono. Too. I 
use it all the time. And uh, he was there and gave a talk. It was it was fantastic. Tokyo is also like my new favorite city in the world. It's like, my number one yeah. dream destination. We need right a business now. expense reason to go to Tokyo. So mm-hmm. help us out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe <laughs> like we can figure figure something. We out. we yeah. can do. We can have Ryan on there. But yeah, the condition is like it has to have the recording has to happen in Tokyo. But Ryan, yes. Ryan loves Tokyo more than any of us. Like mm. there was like a lunch meeting where we discussed some stuff, and he insisted that we go to Seven Eleven to like get like, nice. microwave food. So yeah. we won't have to twist his arm to get it. All right, fair enough. <laughs> All right, cool. That's- All right, thanks everyone for listening. If you liked it, please subscribe, leave us some ratings and reviews. We appreciate it, and we will catch you next time. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Yeah.